Do you get hung up over your dinosaur model scaling? Why is the 140 scale commonly used with dinosaurs? And what does it mean? Let's dig a little deeper into the science behind your dinosaur model collection. Hi, Everything Dinosaur here, and in this short video, we'll briefly look at some of the factors behind deciding the scale for a dinosaur model. Don't forget to subscribe and to hit that notification button to be part of the conversation. As collectors, we're all very familiar with dinosaur models being in 1 to 40 scale. Prehistoric mammals, for example, the convention is to have them in 1 to 20 scale. But not all manufacturers use these scale sizes. The Bullyland Museum line is in 1 to 30 scale, whilst Rebor and PNSO tend to use a 1 to 35 scale ratio, particularly for some of the larger figures, whilst Papo, for example, tend not to declare a scale for their models at all. Even when manufacturers claim the same scale for their figures, the actual models within those ranges can be very different sizes. Take, for example, the Natural History Museum range and Collector and their Collector Deluxe Scale models. Both these manufacturers tend to use the 1 to 40 scale size. But if we look at the Natural History Museum T-Rex, and we compare it to the collector Roaring Feathered T-Rex Dinosaur, both of which purport to be in 1 to 40 scale, we see that there is a big size difference in the models. The Natural History Museum T-Rex measures 26 centimetres long, whereas, in contrast, the collector Feathered Roaring T-Rex, it measures a whopping 34 centimetres. So who's right? Let's define what we actually mean by scale and show you how to estimate the scale of a figure before we answer that question. Let's start with an assumption. T-Rex, the Tyrant Lizard King, grew to about 13 metres in length. To calculate the scale of the model, simply measure the size of your figure, and at everything dinosaur we tend to use the length from the tip of the jaws to the end of the tail, and divide this measurement by the estimated length in centimetres of the actual dinosaur. With the feathered roaring T-Rex from Collector, for example, we get a body length of around 34 centimetres. Divide this into the approximate body length of a fully grown adult T-Rex, which is about 1,300 centimetres, and we get a scale of 1 to 38, or thereabouts. If we do the same with the 26 centimetres long Natural History Museum T-Rex model, we get a scale of approximately 1 to 50. If we focus on the Natural History Museum models, this range has been around for more than 15 years, and Everything Dinosaur has been asked by the manufacturer to propose new figures to be included in this series. But when it comes to scaling any new models, there are other factors that need to be taken into account. The Natural History Museum series are supplied in boxes. We call them plinth. And one of the important parameters that needs to be considered is to produce dinosaur and prehistoric animal models that can fit within the constraints of the existing size of the product packaging. Manufacturers are very interested in managing costs of production. That's what drives them. That's what floats their boat. The manufacturer does not want to develop a whole new size of packaging to accommodate a new figure, but would rather utilise the existing packaging, even if it means compromising on the product size and subsequently the scale declaration. Utilising the existing packaging helps to keep everything consistent, the way the individual models are packed into cases, the way the packaging is printed, how the branding shows, transport costs and shelf space consideration for the retainer. Coupled with the general rule, the bigger the model, the more expensive it is to make. For manufacturers, it's about controlling costs. So in some ranges, the actual size of the model that can be produced can be limited by the manufacturing and packaging constraints. Does all this matter? Not really. The scale declaration is a guide. It's an approximation. Even the most avid and fastidious collector 
has to give the manufacturer some slack. Any scale declared for a given figure is subject to the actual size estimates made by paleontologists when the animal was alive. There are quite a few dinosaur size problems when it comes to sizing up prehistoric animals. Firstly, the dinosauria belong to the class Reptilia. Many reptiles, like a number of other vertebrates, exhibit a biological phenomenon called indeterminate growth, which means when they reach adult size, their growth slows down, but it does not entirely stop. You probably know all about the tyrannosaurs and how they grew rapidly after hatching, and their teenage growth spurts. Over the last two decades or so, there have been incredible advances in the science of dinosaur ontogeny, the study of how dinosaurs develop and change as they grow. This coupled with bone histology, when thin polished cross-sections of fossilised prehistoric animal bone are studied under a microscope. This has helped scientists to determine growth rates, and even the age of a dinosaur when it died. Truth is, we don't actually know how big dinosaurs could get. And this throws the question of determining the scale of a model rather up in the air. Take, for example, a sauropod, one that is estimated to have a body length when a fully mature adult of about 12 metres. That's 1,200 centimetres long. As an adult, that peaceful herbivore, happily plodding along with its herd, lives for, say, a further 60 years. And over that time, it increases its size by an average of just 10 centimetres per year. That represents less than 1% of its original adult body length. But six decades later, when the animal dies, it has put on an extra 60 times 10 centimetres of growth. That's a whopping six metres, which means that when the sauropod met its demise, it was around 80 metres long. That's 50% bigger than it was when it first became an adult animal. If dinosaurs exhibit indeterminate growth, that is, they get a little larger for each year that they lived, then providing an accurate scale for a particular dinosaur model, well, it gets a little tricky. There are other factors to consider too. In most cases, we don't have lots of fossils of a species of dinosaur to study. Many species have been described from single specimens, and highly fragmentary ones at that. So determining the maximum body size for any given species of dinosaur is fraught with difficulties. Even in those species where we have a relative abundance of fossil material to study, problems over determining the potential maximum size of any given individual can occur. Let's illustrate this point by looking at the hadrosaurid Edmontosaurus. This duck-billed dinosaur is known from a huge amount of fossil material, including some bone beds, all found in North America. We have lots of bones to study, and when a dinosaur gets reconstructed for a museum, it's the bones, or casts of them anyway, that get used to build the dinosaur exhibit. But what if the way that a dinosaur exhibit has been put together proves to be inaccurate? For some years now, paleontologists have been working on the remarkably well-preserved specimen of an Edmontosaurus, one that was rapidly buried and that led to a degree of soft tissue preservation. The fossil discovery was made by American paleontologist Tyler Lyson whilst on field work in North Dakota. The specimen, ironically nicknamed Dakota, when subjected to CT scans revealed that the articulated vertebra, the bones making up the spine, were further apart than previously thought. It might just be a fraction of a centimetre either side of the centrum, but when applied to the length of the backbone, this means that Edmontosaurus was probably bigger than previously thought. So, if we don't really know how big a dinosaur got to be, it can be problematical when trying to find a scale to fit your dinosaur model collection. At Everything Dinosaur, if a scale is given by the model manufacturer, then we ensure that the scale is part of the description on the product page on the Everything Dinosaur website. We also measure the models ourselves and we post up these measurements in the additional information link on the product page. Let's take a look. 
Here's the recently introduced collector Fuquisaurus dinosaur model on Everything Dinosaur's website. We've ensured that the scale size, as provided by the manufacturer collector, is here in the product title and it is also shown in the product description. If you click on the additional information link, you will see that the actual model measurements are given as provided by Everything Dinosaur team members. Our message is simple. Please don't get too hung up over the declared scale size of manufacturers' models. They are manufacturers' conventions, and after all, we're not too certain how big many dinosaurs were. Which brings us to this, our question of the day. How do you arrange and sort your prehistoric animal model collection? Do you sort them by scale, or do you use some other method? Share your collecting thoughts and experiences in the comments section below. It would be great to hear from you. Ultimately, it's your prehistoric animal model collection, and you can sort them and display them any way you like. After all, no one's ever seen a living non-avian dinosaur. Just remember, as manufacturers have expanded their model range and introduced new dinosaur figures, so any declared scale convention for a range becomes a little more fluid. This coupled with our increased knowledge of the dinosauria, thanks to more research and fossil discoveries, this has led to a detachment of many scale conventions from dinosaur model ranges. And on that note, I'll say thanks for watching. Thank you.